Well, good morning, everybody. Saturday, March 9th, 2024, Coffee and Conversation, DFL 52. We are overjoyed to have our good friend, uh, uh, DFL uh, Senate Majority Leader Aaron Murphy, as our guest this morning. Um, Aaron, I was looking back. Uh, um, you were last in Coffee and Conversation, albeit you've been to other of our events, but Coffee and Conversation was August of 2019. Um, so welcome back. And when you were with us in 2019, it was in person at the uh, cafe at Egan Byerly's. So uh, this is our Zoom experience, which I'm sure you've had a, a, a few of uh, uh, before. Um, give you the floor for a few opening remarks. And then as you might anticipate, I've got tons of questions and people will raise their hand uh, to uh, ask questions and we will uh, open, open up their microphones at that point in time. So tell us what's on your mind. Well, um, good morning, everyone. It is good to see uh, very, very familiar faces and some new, uh, new to me faces as well uh, from this Senate district that for me always, always represents the transition that we've experienced together in the last 15 to 20 years, uh, where our suburban districts in the in the state of Minnesota have transitioned um, gradually, uh, but assuredly. Uh, from red to purple and to blue. Uh, and I always think about Senate District now 52, then 51 as one of the leaders um, in that trajectory. And uh, I I think that's why I've always like jumped at the chance to come and join um, you in conversation because the experience that you have had and the experience that you bring to the body politic is important. Um, to me, it is in many ways um, a bellwether uh, for what we're seeing and feeling. I feel the same way about Senator Carlson. So I am, I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, I'm sorry we're not in person, but I know that this facilitates um, uh, our ability to get together and, and that makes sense as well. So I'm, I'm in my kitchen um, and happy to join you. Uh, as we are now, you know, well into the start of the 2024 session with uh, you know, about a month under our belt. Um, There's about a month uh, and a budget forecast that has uh, set a foundation uh, and we are working uh, hard and fast. It is the second year of the biennium is from my perspective, always harder uh, because there isn't as much time and yet uh, necessary work to do for the people of Minnesota. And those two things um, make uh, the work uh, pretty intense. And you're starting to, I'm starting to feel that in the Capitol now. Thanks well, for having it's me. funny you should it's funny you should mention being in your kitchen because I recall a couple of days ago um, there was a female senator who was giving remarks from her kitchen um, and they were uh, they will likely be the subject of Saturday Night Live's cold open um, this week. Uh, happily, yours will be uh, a little bit more professional than 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 that was. Um, you know, one of the things I've always in, enjoyed about you is your optimism and your joy in in the work that you do. What gives you hope in the current political environment? Uh, my, I have a deep well of hope and it is rooted in us. It is rooted in our capacity um, to make change using the tools of policy and politics. It is rooted in what I experience over and over with Minnesotans across the state who are willing to do the hard and necessary to work to make sure their lives and their families and their communities are um, moving in the direction that they want to. Uh, I always figure if, you know, a group of people are willing to get together on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock to talk about our future, um, then I'm going to join that group uh, because I want to talk about that too. And I want to do it with Minnesotans. Uh, and so that's, that is squarely where my hope rests. Um, we don't make the progress in the Capitol uh, for Minnesotans uh, alone. We do it together. Um, and so much of the work that we're able to do in the capital starts um, in our in our districts, in our homes, uh, in our own, you know, concerns and hopes. Uh, and I want to always keep my my center there. Um, so that is what gives me the hope to 
to do this work. Well, um, do I, I'm, in, I'm interested in, in your both your macro and your micro view of the state of politics in Minnesota, uh, particularly as they relate to the Senate, which, by the way, congratulations on your election as majority leader. Uh, well deserved. Uh, sorry it arose under the circumstances it did. Uh, but the, we know that the DFL in the Senate is in good hands. Um, you've got a 34 to 33 majority. That's kind of razor thin. Um, every once in a while, I hear about one of the representatives, sometimes it's Senate, sometimes it's House, and I've lost track. Um, are, are you still at a 34, 33? Are there any issues of people uh, leaving in the, the near future? Senator Dietzik may or may not uh, uh, be in her seat uh, next time the election rolls around, or God forbid, hopefully uh, she'll uh, be uh, uh, in the seat through through the end of the term. Um, Assuming that Senator Morrison wins in CD3, you'll lose a seat there. How do you get that one filled? Are there any other risks to losing the majority in the Senate uh, between now and the next election, which is a couple years away? I uh, I really appreciate that question. And I'm, I'm going to pause to say wherever Senator Carlson you want to join in here, you should just jump in. Um, I want to I want to start at the beginning of your question, uh, Ron Goldzer, uh, to say that none of us in the Senate DFL caucus were anticipating, nor did we want um, the transition that we've experienced. Uh, and the thing that we uh, have learned from the tremendous leadership of uh, Leader Dietzik is that we uh, can get more done for the people of Minnesota when we choose to stay together and stick together, um, and. You know, there will always be, because we have a razor thin majority, there will always be um, people who are considering the issues in front of us, not from a, necessarily from a leverage point of view, but, you know, how do I feel about that? Am I, am I, am I in a position in the district I represent uh, to support that or not? What do I need to do? That is the normal course of our work. It's just a little amplified because of our, our narrow majority. Um, and I, I hear from many of our members of our caucus who are working on issues who are working hard to earn uh, votes from Republicans in the other caucus uh, in order to move things forward. So I, I think that is that is the work of the legislature, that is uh, the tradition of the Senate, uh, and that continues and persists. Uh, we moved a big agenda last session, in part because there was an agenda that had been I think shaped over many, many years, probably acutely from the last trifecta to this one, and a lot of work done with Minnesotans uh, to tee up a significant agenda given uh, the, you know, the value of a trifecta. Uh, and that that kind of work to, you know, make sure that we are hearing from Minnesotans both in the electoral space and in the just in the conversation space, whether in town halls or surveys or deep canvassing. Yeah, you know, where are the people of Minnesota right now on uh, the next generation of issues um, that continue to solve the chronic issues that we experience, whether it is in childcare or housing or the next gener generation of work that we will pursue uh, to make sure we're protecting the climate um, while the, uh, the the climate is changing. Uh, what are we going to do next on healthcare, et cetera? Um, when I think about the last election in the next election, I do think we will have a special election in CD3, Senate District 45. Uh, I, th I think we'll have a special election uh, when Kelly Morrison is clearly the person who we're going to send to Congress uh, from Minnesota. Uh, I think about the 24 election more, uh, 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 more broadly than that race. And of course, uh, Kelly won that seat by, I think, 12 points. Um, and as Senate District 52 has grown, uh, more blue, so are the western suburbs. So I know that we have a very, very fine chance of holding that seat, uh, but it will also be an expensive seat uh, because the Republicans will understand that they can uh, secure the majority from us by winning there. So uh, laying a strong foundation now uh, uh, to make sure that we are ready when the seat is actually up uh, is really critically important. The 24 election for me is not just about that seat, it is about making sure that we're doing our part to hold the trifecta, because the trifecta is the path to do more work for the people of Minnesota. And so I, I want us, and I will be, but I, I'm gonna invite my colleagues as well, um, 
to, and we've talked about this some, to engage in the race, either in the districts in which they live or in the districts where the house is competing in order to keep the trifecta because that is uh, the path to do more for the people of Minnesota. It also makes sure that we are in good practice um, in the districts we represent and in other parts of the state. If we are continuing to flex our muscles on the political skills that help us stay in the majority, whether it is door knocking or fundraising um, or working strategically um, in the places where we need to keep the house, that just makes sure that we are uh, on our toes and ready for 26, where we will be competing again for the majority. I, I also know that in the last election cycle, we had a really strong field of candidates and some of those candidates are gonna wanna run again. Run again. So let's engage them in this cycle as well, um, in the house races in the district. So they're you know remaining fresh in their skills and in touch with Minnesotans because four years is a very, very long time in politics. Um, and what we campaigned on in 22, will be different in 26. I um, mean, the best way to stay fresh there is to be in uh, regular contact with Minnesotans. So you I feel excited about the elections. You know, I love elections. So, I I, yeah. I do. I've, I've been out there with you from time to time. You And you are one of the, mo the most tireless um, campaigners that I have ever met. Um, but most importantly, it's not just about winning. It's about uh, winning with a vision, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, but that, that leads me to uh, a broader broader question, and that is the, the scope of, of some of the work and, and how outstate uh, compares to to the metro area uh, at this point, and how outstate now compares to outstate, say, four years ago, and particularly uh, in the context of a presidential election, which I can't tell if it's close or not. Uh, I can't tell with these polls. Uh, I can't tell with the pundits whether it's a close election nationwide or in Minnesota. So I'd like to get your thoughts on polarization, the presidential election, outstate versus metro. That's not a big question or anything. And before we do that, Rangel, so I think Jim Carlson, my colleague, has his hand up. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, I just want to add to some of the things that uh, were already said here that, uh, uh, first of all, Erin Murphy has it in her DNA, as did uh, Carrie Dietzik a lot of good and open communication. And uh, she has been one of the most av available majority leaders we've ever had. And uh, um, you know, I would be derelict if I would say there's anything that I'm not happy with. I'm very happy with how she has run everything, how she has run our caucuses, how she has run our one vote majority. And uh, like I say, she's so available to me. She sits right behind me on the Senate floor. So I can turn around and bring anything up to her that I'd like. But she has been so open to uh, even the, some of the people that maybe disagree slightly and we can work things out. So it is really one of the best run and best organized majorities that I've ever been part of. And I've been part of a few different ones. So uh, I'm, I'm just so... I'm so happy that Majority Leader Murphy is our Majority Leader. So that's uh, and you know, and then on the other things that you're getting into here, uh, we are, I believe, at another pinnacle of an important, um, important election, and uh, this is going to be one that is going to, uh, you know, nationally, it's going to focus whether we're going to be living in a in a totalitarian government or whether we're going to be still in a democracy a year from now. And I think that's real important for us to, uh, you know, in our our district here has been uh, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder in getting things done. So we need to make sure that we continue that. And uh, I'm I'm very happy and I'm very pleased that I think that that's going to happen again. So uh, you know, that's my that's my pitch for an addition. I'll have a couple, maybe a couple of questions later on. Thanks, Jim. Aaron, the question no uh, is outstate presidential political uh, silos. Your thoughts? So we, um, Ron, you and I have you know spent so many cups of coffee talking about uh, our regional differences and uh, the things that bring us together, and I. I I always think about this in a couple of categories. So when I first uh, came to the Senate, my first term, 
in the minority, I served on the tax committee. Um, I was in the property tax division of the tax committee with Senator Rust, Senator Klein, Senator Dietzik. Uh, and we had a very, very early debate about uh, communities responsibility to reimburse for mutual aid um, and how do these mutual aid uh, contracts essentially get set up among communities. So how does Minnesota benefit from the burn unit in Ramsey County or the, the richer uh, uh, emergency uh, equipment in Hennepin County? How do we share those assets um, and what is the, the mechanism for that? And uh, an early fight that the Republicans picked with us was that um, the core cities were not uh, fulfilling their obligations there. And we had a debate on the floor um, that day, not about the Twin Cities versus Greater Minnesota, but about what we do together for Minnesotans. Um, that we share assets and resources um, in order to serve in our best our best capacity the people of Minnesota, and we in some ways turned the argument on our Republican colleagues who were trying to say you know you people in the cities aren't doing your part, and reminding them that the people who live in St. Paul and Minas in Minneapolis are Minnesotans just like are the people who live all across the state of Minnesota, and we should be looking out for each other and not dividing. When I think about the urban and rural construct, in some ways it is a political construct meant to divide us. Um, and it is also accurate to say, and right to say and recognize that our regions are different. We have different uh, economies, regional economies. Um, we have different natural resources. Uh, we, we approach issues in some cases in um, slightly different ways. And it means that our coalition, our big coalition may have different reactions to how we think about uh, timber, how we think about um, water. What is the right balance between agriculture and water? What is the right balance um, on uh, like natural resources and people? Uh, how are we approaching um, uh, the deer herd and CWD and the public's health. Um, those issues um, emerge differently in different parts of the state and we have to balance those as we think about public policy. But there's also a really strong vein of here are the things that we need together. There's an organization called the Center for Rural Policy and Development. The, le the legislature actually created this organization a number of years ago and it is a research organization and we ask them um, to look at issues uh, regarding rural communities and uh, what what are we doing as a public body uh, to sustain or inform ourselves on the path. They released a study at the start of the 22-23 session uh, that said the, the way in which from their research to assure that rural communities are thriving is not about jobs, 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 first and foremost, or industrial parks, or recruiting businesses to communities. It is about making sure that people have access to affordable childcare, housing, and broadband. Um, and with those investments, people can make a choice about where they choose to live. We all care. We are all experiencing um, issues with housing in our communities. Um, we are experiencing and people are paying dearly for child care. We have a child care workforce shortage. Child care is very expensive for families and it doesn't pay very well. That's a problem um, that we made a lot of headway in the last session. We've made tremendous headway on broadband. Um, and I think when we put those pieces in place um, and we add health care on top of that, because health care is becoming quite a crisis in greater Minnesota, um, we, we create conditions for people to be able to choose to live where they want to. Uh, and so while there is a political construct around urban and rural, and you can see that in the blue and the red, there's also a, a deeply felt policy path. Um, and in some ways it, it uh, creates real questions and tensions for us. And in other ways, it is the central part of our work. 
um, to make sure that wherever you live in Minnesota, you have access to the things that you need to be able to work and live and raise your family um, and build a future together with the democracy that actually serves us. And in the last election, issues of democracy and freedom uh, were front and center for us as Democrats. Um, and I think that's going to be the case in this next election. And those are very unifying uh, themes. They're very strong themes. And we know that both things are freedom uh, to the live the life of our choosing, um, our ability to use our democracy to build that. Both of those things remain threatened, especially by one of the people who's running for president. So I, I feel a lot of urgency about the work in front of us and in this election in the same way that I did in 22. And I think because of that, the 24 election is going to tip in our direction. You make the analysis sound so easy and so facile, uh, and yet I suspect uh, uh, Republicans just don't see it that way. You know, it's uh, it's about no, you know, no, thank you, uh, stay away. I'm not interested in having any discussions about any of the policy things that that you just described. And again, it's a an urban rural construct, political construct. But nevertheless, you've got to get bills passed. How do you get there? I think I think we demonstrated our capacity to do that last year uh, by moving a really significant policy agenda and a big budget. Uh, that was the result of a lot of work over a number of years, um, building support with the people of Minnesota all over the state. Uh, and you know, I, I I was like to one of the first issues we took up was an issue that we couldn't muster the votes for a decade ago, and that was driver's licenses for all. We spent the last decade and more in many parts of the state talking about why that policy is the right policy for Minnesotans. Um, and I, you know, over the years, I've had lots of conversations with people in rural places. Um, and rural places are, you know, are just like where we live, are growing more diverse. Um, and so there are significant Latino populations in southwestern Minnesota, in southeastern Minnesota, up, up the, the spine of the seventh congressional district. Um, where we see uh, a lot of agriculture, we see growing populations of people of color. Um, there's a growing Hmong population, a growing Somali population. Uh, and I, in the last session, we made more possible for people who aren't documented, whether it is driver's licenses or access to health care or uh, equal treatment in the tax code. Um, it is, I think, a, an ongoing and difficult conversation, but the politics that I believe in says, we're gonna go <clears throat> talk with Minnesotans about those issues. That's how we make the progress. And if the expectation is inside the Capitol, we're gonna pass something that is challenging by just making sure we have 34 votes. Um, I think we're not gonna get where we need to go. Um, if we do the legwork <clears throat> to bring Minnesotans along with us, and they're the ones that are saying, yep, this is the right policy for us, then those 34 votes or more become more possible. And that's the theme. I, I think that's probably the most profound lesson I have learned in my tenure in serving in public office, um, that the election certificate alone and a majority um, don't guarantee that you can move public policy that we need to move. Um, we do have to have the support and the consent of the people of Minnesota, which, you know, to our point is why we like to spend so much time talking with Minnesotans. Uh, there is an old expression that my lawyer mentor uh, used to have, and that was do the right thing, the money will follow. Mm -hmm. well, in, in your circumstances, it's do the right thing, the votes will follow. And, and that's kind of what I hear you saying. Let me let me turn to a specific uh, uh, issue, and that's education. Um, education is increasingly near and dear to my heart, um, not the least of which because I have a couple of grandsons. But you, you may know that I volunteer in an elementary school in Northeast Minneapolis in Mayor Fry's uh, uh, council district. Uh, and over the course of the years with some school uh, district redistricting, uh, the population has become uh, increasingly minority. Um, and I don't say there's a causal relation or even a correlational relation, but the discipline uh, of the students has become increasingly difficult very difficult. It could well be a COVID phenomenon because the kids didn't get socialized. I work in a in a first grade class. We have several kids in that class who are violent, uh, who throw chairs and wastebaskets, um, who 
punch other kids, who punch volunteers, witness me. Um, and so what's going on in schools is a, a very great concern to me. I, I noticed in your uh, campaign website um, to take a couple of phrases and put them together. Um, what you said was our schools are incredibly underfunded. Um, we, uh, as we add to the formula, we also need to specifically invest in early learning, funding full service community schools that support students and their families inside and out of the classroom and ensuring our educators reflect the growing diversity of our students. I asked my teacher if she would join us this morning. I don't see her on the line, but I also asked her, what would you like Senator Murphy to say or, or to address? And that is funding for schools and funding for communities to make sure that the kids uh, are prepared to learn both uh, hunger, discipline, socialization, and all of those things. Um, I noticed in a couple of articles, one of which that uh, is an op-ed that you co-wrote with Melissa Hortman and then some others from the Strib, education was not on the top of the list, at least in this uh, coming session. So I guess I'd like to, to know what you're thinking about uh, in uh, education, what we can do to better fund schools. I'm worried about the, uh, the, the potential teacher's strike in Minneapolis, the one in St. Paul was diverted. I, I'm going on and on, forgive me for rambling, but uh, lots of pieces of education that are out there that, that need help. Help. Uh, I, um, I really appreciate the question. Uh, this is an area where we made a significant financial commitment to our public schools in the budget that we passed. Um, we put more money into the cross subsidy. Um, so we were better funding special education. We put more money into the formula, um, which is an equitable, a more equitable distribution of funding. We put money into uh, mental health care, counselors, school nurses, um, and to early learning uh, with voluntary pre-K and more slots in VPK, voluntary pre-kindergarten, which is uh, something that uh, you know I've been working on uh, since uh, Governor Dayton uh, first proposed it back. I don't know how many years ago. And the part that has been striking for me is despite that um, significant investment in our schools, um, the schools are still, some of the schools, many of our schools are still struggling with the finances of what they face in part because of declining enrollment. Um, but I, I think we're at that place of recognizing the divestment that started back in the early 2000s um, under Tim Pawlenty um, and trying to catch up there. And then the dual pressures that uh, we're feeling in schools across the state of pension costs um, and healthcare costs. And the healthcare costs and what that is doing to school budgets is pretty acute right now. It's something that we had worked on a decade ago and, and put our hands around with the Health Insurance Transparency Act. Um, but that has uh, been I think significantly undermined by efforts to try and pull people out of the public employee insurance plan. And that plan has experienced some instability in the course of uh, the pandemic. It's it's stabilized again, but um, we've done, not us, but the Department of Management and Budget has done a pretty deep dive in terms of understanding what we need to do to stabilize PEEP for the long run, if it's gonna serve the purpose of healthcare coverage for educators who choose it. So we're, we're in a place again where we've made a significant investment in our schools. Um, it is an important investment. It is a catch-up investment and their costs in some, in some categories continue to rise. Um, and healthcare is the one that feels the most acute um, to me. And that's impacting you know, school districts and school budgets across the state. I was um, both surprised and, and relieved to see the St. Paul Federation of Educators and the St. Paul School District reach a tentative agreement. And I don't know the details there. Uh, I don't think they, they've been published yet. I've been looking for them. Yeah, they haven't been. And the same thing happened in Anoka Hennepin. Um, for me, that's a bit of a good sign um, that the work that we've done um, has been, uh, has produced uh, some progress for our schools. Um, but I think we have, you know, a, 
I don't know quite how to describe this because you raised a number of issues um, in the schools um, and school discipline and the state of the kids coming to schools, um, I think is a real vexing problem for us. Um, when I think about the parallel in nursing and where nurses are facing more violence and disruption um, in hospitals and other settings, to me, that continues to point to the direction that we just need a little more staff. The best way to manage the hard situations that people face, whether it's in classrooms or hospitals, um, is to make sure we have enough hands on deck uh, to prevent that. Um, that. That to me is an intervention that is necessary. The last thing I wanna say um, that, you know, was probably one of the most important things that we did around education is universal school meals. And it has been astonishing to me to watch that, the politics of that unfurl. Uh, we, all, we all know this, right? You can't learn if you're hungry. Um, and there are a lot of kids coming to school hungry and we were uh, spending a lot in administrative costs um, to decide who was eligible and not uh, for a school breakfast and a school lunch. And we've turned those resources into just providing a school breakfast and a school lunch for kids. And the uptake has been really, really significant. Um, and that to me just is a proof point that it, it is both necessary and useful. The other place where we did an important intervention when I think about young people is the child tax credit that is also seeing significant uptake on the part of low and middle-class families um, who can uh, get a refundable tax credit um, in a meaningful way. This is a tool that we learned from the federal government a number of years ago. We put it in place temporarily during the pandemic and then it went away and we've put it into the budget now going forward. Um, it is intended to cut childhood poverty and I think that's gonna have a real impact on kids in schools in the future. Jim Carlson, do you have anything to add there? I think you're doing a wonderful job. Majority leader Murphy. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking notes here on things that uh, uh, just to remind myself of the things that we did. There were so many things that we did. We had to reread -re some of these bills just to find out what we did because there was so much that had been done. And I don't know if anybody picked up my handouts in, uh, in the caucuses, but uh, I had a list of things that uh, I needed to put dollars on them where we spent dollars because uh, some of the criticism is always, how did you get rid of the $17 billion of surplus? And you know, and that really we did. You know, I, there was the question of give it back and we did, we gave it back. We gave it back in the places with, where you would say that it's an investment for the future. And I think uh, uh, what you just heard from the majority leader is some of the places where we did give it back and it's an investment that maybe won't return instantly, but it will return as especially like our, our workforce gets better educated. Uh, there might be some things that uh, we should still be doing to address the item that you brought up, Ron, and that is uh, some of the, uh, the instability of families, which that can, uh, that can trickle down to having some violence because the kids are, are not really feeling the, the stability that you and I did when we were young. And so what we need to do is we need to have counselors. We need to have, uh, you know, these uh, uh, family stabilizing subsidies that I think are really important for the future. And so that's, uh, that's where I'm at. And I think the majority leader has done an excellent job in describing some of those to you. And I'm hoping that uh, this is the kind of thing where we drill a hole in someone's head and pour in this information so they're able to repeat it when someone challenges you on what we have done uh, in, in the last session, especially the last session. And I, I say it over and over again that I've staffed the Senate booth at the State Fair for every year that it was available except the COVID year. And this last year in nineteen or in uh, 2023 was the first time that I ever staffed that booth and did not have one person that came up to the booth with their fingers, you know, their hands clenched and telling me how terrible of, of a job we did and how we were up there for five months and didn't get anything done. That is a, uh, is a, is a milestone for me that I'm really proud that we, uh, we were part of that. 
And I think we're uh, we're set up to do a lot in in the twenty twenty four session. But like the majority leader said, that the time is tight. Uh, we don't have as many days. We don't have as many legislative days. We don't have as uh, you know the uh, we've got still have big bills. And so some bills, and this is just something to kind of help with you understand to understand that some bills are quite large, and just organizing the time to hear them is a real challenge. So we're approaching first deadline that's coming up pretty soon. And we have a lot of things that we need to get done. And I think a lot of the committees are, are we're, we're really spinning to try to get everything fit in before the, the deadline. And of course, uh, you, you all know, I think that this is the second year of a two year session. So every bill that does not get addressed this year uh, goes on the shelf and has to be reinitiated next year when the new new two year session starts. Um, I I saw that uh, Jeff Sparts uh, had a long comment in the chat, and Jeff, you know, in a second, I'm going to give you the floor, and and you can raise your comment or or question. Uh, but before we do that, Aaron, I just wanted to give you a couple of anecdotal items of feedback on on where education is working and where it needs help. Uh, in my school, the breakfast for everybody is a big deal. And it is phenomenal. And so the kids will go up to the cafeteria, get their breakfast, and come back to the classroom and sit around the breakfast table. And we read together. And they choose books, and I choose books. Um, and it's not quiet and, and lovely and paying attention all the time, but we read together. And so that works really well. One of the other things I've seen in my school this year is an, a, an enormous increase I don't know if they're formally SROs, school resource officers, or what they are, but they're the disciplinary disciplinary people. Uh, and they come in and take the, the troubled kids out and work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Last year, the last few years, there's been one such person. That Right now, there are so many in the school that I can't even count them. Uh, that's a good thing, but it also reflects a problem of the need uh, for, for people like that. So... Funding that organization, that group of people, is hugely important. I saw in the strip the other day that with the uh, Minneapolis School District budget problem, one of the things they're going to cut uh, is fifth grade instrumental music. My fourth and fifth grade classes just went down to Orchestra Hall just this past week, and the Minnesota Orchestra put on a concert for them. And one of my friends, a violist in the orchestra, came down to uh, where my school was sitting and had a conversation with them. That's going to be eliminated. Two years ago, the Spanish was eliminated. And finally, in this year, um, when we had our first meeting in the fall, uh, I, I went to it, and there were five people who I remembered from the prior year. Everyone else was new. Stability in the teaching staff is hugely important. So this may not be a budget year in the legislature, but for every year that goes by is a year missed. Um, and so these problems can't wait for the budget year. Uh, they need to be addressed sooner rather than later. I don't know if you have the ability to do that to, to help out in, in these arenas, but gosh, they're important. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jeff, uh, um, Jeff Sparts, did you want to uh, uh, raise the comment that you talked about in chat? Uh, we need to unmute you somehow. There you go. I'm unmuted. You are unmuted. Uh, um, my comment is one of concern in that reliable polls show that we continue to slip as a party with support from the working classes. And uh, are, are these voters not perceiving that we're addressing the kinds of issues that are important to them? Uh, the progressive wing of the party seems to dominate the agenda and that mostly focuses on social issues. And I'd like to remind people that the second major tenant that Martin Luther King worked on was uplifting all poor people, whether they're brown, uh, black, or white. So does the party need to look at a little refocus here? Uh, thanks for that question, Jeff Sparts. And I, I saw it in the chat. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, um, I, would, I would really appreciate just like one more sentence about 
like what what the agenda, if you wish. Um, but when I think about what we accomplished last session for all Minnesotans, and in particular the work that we did for working people, uh, and the bills that were still that are still coming. I'm like we we heard uh, legislation that would allow more people uh, to properly organize uh, at the University of Minnesota uh, requires some changes to PELRA. Uh, there's a piece of legislation moving through right now dealing with the misclassification of workers uh, that uh, if not repaired, people, especially lower income people, um, are being classified as independent contractors in some situations and not employees. Uh, and are losing access to the benefits of full employment. Um, our caucus has, has you know, whether it is the, the work that we did with Amazon and, and worker safety, um, the, the work that we did for refinery workers, uh, for um, like both workplace safety and workplace dignity, uh, even structural changes, like what we did, Jim and I did together, Senator Carlson and I did together in the state and local government uh, proposal that uh, put the emphasis of negotiating contracts and the result of that contract um, into effect without playing a political game in the legislature um, and using uh, public employee contracts as a leverage point um, in the legislature, uh, we we did a tremendous amount of work for the working class and for working people and for uh, their ability to be advocates for themselves in the workplace. Uh, I, I think that's really important work. Um, and it is squarely trying to address what you are raising, um, Jeff Sparts, that uh, we know that uh, working people uh, have been in many cases working one and two jobs and not making ends meet and they're feeling frustrated about that and they should. Um, it becomes an easy me mechanism for uh, political uh, messaging and developing uh, you know divisions. Um, and I think we we not only appreciate that but took a pretty powerful action in the last session. I think you'll see some more. Uh, in this session to address uh, working people and their ability to earn and support their families. I'm, fl I'm flexing my blue collar right now. <laughs> well, and, and Aaron, I know you said you wanted to be sure to be done by uh, an hour or maybe even a little less. I know we're coming up about that time. Um, I have a number of issues that I wanted to, to raise. We're not going to get to them. So maybe in, in one of those... Uh, um, I forgot what they're called, rapid fire sessions. Um, you, you can talk about homelessness, um, reproductive freedom and in vitro fertilization, uh, gender affirming rights act, uh, SF 2236 mm -hmm. and, and gun safety. So pick an issue or pick issues and tell us where you're headed. And if I've missed one that's important, you can add that one in. There's a lot of work being done right now in the housing committee um, dealing with policy. Um, we, we made a pretty significant investment in housing uh, last session, uh, but the, the House and the Senate together are looking at um, policy matters uh, that allow for uh, more multi-unit multi, multi um, unit housing um, in more places um, to continue to approach the ways that uh, people have access to affordable housing in communities across the state. Um, I think that, you know, one of the seminal moments of my experience as a person in politics is the Dobbs decision at the Supreme Court and the continued march um, by courts. Um, and in this case, the Alabama Supreme Court making a decision on IVF um, or on embryos as uh, people um, will have profound and resounding impacts across the country. Um, as, a, as a nurse, a licensed nurse, I... I worry a lot about the training um, and the, the biases of people practicing in states where there are limitations now on the care of people, um, comprehensive care for people who are 
wanting to get pregnant or are pregnant. Um, you think about that comprehensive care of primary care, prenatal care, maternity care, postnatal care, and abortion care. Um, there are all sorts of things that happen to bodies um, in that period of time. If you're not trained and prepared to deal with somebody who's miscarrying, who's got an ectopic pregnancy, if you are unclear or unsure of the ramifications for you to care for a person in those situations because of a Supreme Court decision, um, that is going to have impacts for the provision of care across the country, especially as we think about um, national compacts that allow people to move from state to state with real ease. Um, the, the IVF decision is going to have ramifications for us as well. Um, and, and you'll see in Minnesota where we are working to make sure that our laws are clear so people have full access to the comprehensive care that they need to start and raise a family. Um, so let's see, gun, gun violence prevention. Um, right. Because of the work of so many people over so much time, we did push through measures last session. And I know that there are members of our, our caucus right now that are working hard on a couple of issues. Um, I, I know there are folks in the St. Paul delegation that are looking at the issue of preemption. There are folks that are looking at the issue of safe storage. And, and those issues are possible only because of the work of Minnesotans who said enough is enough, including people that live right in District, District 52, famously pushing us um, to get to a different place. Um, we are where we are as a result of the work um, that so many people in this Zoom have done that have made that possible. Um, the only one you missed was the Gender Affirming Rights Act. So I, you know, we took the big step last session on trans refuge to make sure that uh, people who come here can get the care that they need. And I believe in the Commerce Committee work, committee this week, they heard a number of bills that deal with, like, for instance, they did the, the legislation that would say ins insurance companies have to cover wigs for people with cancer. Um, they heard a bill dealing with prosthetics and coverage for prosthetics. They heard a bill um, dealing with coverage in the exchange, the health insurance exchange for abortion. Um, and they heard a bill dealing with coverage for gender affirming care. Uh, those are all uh, insurance reforms um, to make sure that people get the full and necessary care. You know this about me. I was an OR nurse at the U. We took care of people when I was there who were transitioning. Um, and I think the question is, uh, should that be, should that be covered by insurance? Is that a condition that should be covered by insurance? I think yes. Um, but it's been the case in Minnesota for a very long time. Um, it's just become, I think, much more politicized because trans lives have become so highly politicized. Well, we, we've hit a uh, time when I want to uh, uh, let you go on and, and actually do the important work that uh, uh, we've just talked about for the last hour or so. You have any closing thoughts for us? I love you guys. I really am grateful um, for a deep friendship that we've built over time. Um, and I mean it, we would not we would not be in the position that we're in right now had it not been for the work that so many of you have done. Sending Jim Carlson to the legislature, he is a senior member of our caucus and very deeply respected. Um, that is what makes our work possible. Um, and I always say, this is an effort that we share together. Like. I, I serve at the pleasure of the people of Minnesota uh, and the work that I do is because and for the people of Minnesota. So I thank you so much for having me this morning and for everything that you continue to do for all of us. Well, you're a real treasure and we're grateful that you took the time to spend with us. And obviously if there's something that we can do for you, you'll be sure to let us know. Um, always I give uh, Lisa, our chair, uh, the opportunity to make any comments. Uh, anything on your mind, Lisa? Well, thank you, Aaron. It's so great to hear from you always. And it gives me such great comfort knowing that you and Jim and everyone, all the other DFLers in our government are, are doing great work for the people of Minnesota. It's really, really comforting. 